Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Nerdy Multiverse and yet another breakdown. Today, we will be breaking down Season 3, Episode 4 of The Mandalorian. In other words, being Chapter 20 of the series, and this episode being titled, The Foundling. This episode starts off back at the Mandalorian covert as we see tons of Mandalorians outside near the water training together. As they spar with all of their different equipment and fire off their blasters and rockets and whatnot into the water. Practically just a huge training session. Bo-Katan walks among the huge crowd here and observes all of the different foundlings, apprentices, and Mandalorians sparring one another. Then, turning to Grogu as he sits on the beach near the water, playing around and observing some little rocks that are actually a bunch of little hermit crab-like creatures crawling under the sand. Mando comes over to Grogu, tells him to stop playing with the rocks, and brings him over to two foundlings that are sparring one another, one of which being the foundling that was brought into the Creed in the first episode. Din walks over and announces that Grogu will be the next challenger. The foundling challenger that Grogu is set to take on, as they have chosen to do a match with training darts, goes on to ask why Grogu does not wear a helmet if he is a part of this creed and a Mandalorian. Din answers his question, and a question that some of us, the audience, may have been wondering ourselves, and tells him that Grogu is unable to speak the creed yet, therefore his face will not be covered yet. So basically, Grogu won't have a fully stacked out Mandalorian suit or helmet until he speaks his first words. And if Grogu truly does go on to become a full-fledged Mandalorian, Mandalorian as well as be a force wielder and a Jedi, that would mean that he would be the second one to do so in all of Star Wars history, right after Tar Vizsla, the creator of and the first wielder of the Dark Saber. Anyways though, the two get their darts as Bo puts him on Grogu's wrist and prepares him with some encouraging words, even though she is skeptical whether the kid even knows how to fire the darts or not. But they begin the match and Ragnar the other foundling wins over Grogu two times before they go into the final round where Grogu gets serious after looking back at Din, where Mando told him to show them all what he can do. So the third and final round starts and Grogu jumps over the other child, then back over him again, much like how we saw Yoda leaping around at such a fast pace when he fought the likes of Dooku. After jumping over the foundling and landing back down, Grogu fires the training darts off three times and lands and immediately wins the match, as Paz Vizsla and the armorer watch on. Because of him doing such crazy tricks and flipping over the kid, Bo asks Mando if he's the one who taught him how to do do that, and of course he says no, it was not him. Obviously, the one who actually taught him all of this stuff would not only be the masters at the Jedi Temple that he had some time with before Order 66 happened, but also Luke Skywalker who he trained with for two straight years, according to Jon Favreau. After Grogu is declared the winner, the other foundling walks off and stares off into the water before a huge creature that the Mandos all call a raptor comes flying over the canyons and snatches a foundling before flying back off. A few Mandalorians go after after the beast, using their jetpacks, including Paz Vizsla and Din. But after flying for some time, their jetpacks all run out of fuel, and it seems as if the beast is going to get away with the foundling and make him its next meal. But of course, we cannot let that happen, as Bo flies after the raptor and her gauntlet starfighter in a beautiful shot scene. After some time, she returns to the covert and informs him that she followed the beast to the point where she knows where its nest is, and she knows exactly how to get back to it. So her, Din, Paz Vizsla, and the armor look over the plans so that they can gather a hunting party of seven Mandalorians and go off to save the foundling. After they take off and head to get the kid back, Grogu is left behind with everyone else and the armor. So she speaks with him and tells him that if he does wish to become a Mandalorian, there is much work to be done as she leads him into the cave. Inside of the cave and at the forge, the armor begins forging a new piece of Beskar armor for Grogu that is made out of some Beskar scraps that she says are all collected by many of the Mandalorians there so that that they can then later be given to the foundlings as is tradition. But after she selects a piece of armor for him and begins melting down the Beskar and then forging it, much like how Mando did, Grogu then begins to get flashbacks of his past, as he clearly has a form of PTSD coming from the events of Order 66 and the sparks coming from the forge are likely the cause of this. He grows evidently very upset as he is starting to remember it all, as we cut into the huge Order 66 flashback that we all saw in the trailers for the season 
season and had many theories about. As the door bursts open in the Jedi Temple and a squadron of 501st clones come storming in, blasting at the four Jedi that are surrounding and protecting Grogu with their lives. They keep yelling out to get Grogu to Kelleran. Now if you don't recognize that name, I do not blame you at all, but I will explain it all in a bit. Before getting eliminated by the 501st clones, the Jedi manage to get Grogu into an elevator before the remaining clones can get to him. As the elevator stops and Grogu grows in fear as to what may be waiting for him on the other side, the door opens up and a Jedi Master greets him on the other side and tells him that everything will be okay. Now, this Jedi is known as Kelleran Beck, and if you don't recognize the actor playing him, this is Ahmed Best, who played none other than Jar Jar Binks. Ahmed has actually already played the character of Kelleran Beck in a game show known as Jedi Temple Challenge. So with him now being in The Mandalorian and the one who saved Grogu from Order 66, his character is technically now canon. Seeing Ahmed Best again, playing a role in Star Wars after all of this time and after everything that happened to him makes me really happy and I am truly super super happy for him and I hope we get to see more of his character. Now I know some people may be let down by who rescued Grogu as so many people had their theories about who was coming through the doors and whatnot such as Anakin or Mace Windu. Even myself had theories about this like Barriss Afi due to the surroundings in the room. However I really love that Ahmed Best got to play Kelleran back yet again and have him be the one to rescue Grogu. But back to the actual episode though, Kelleran Beck picks up the saber of the fallen Jedi in the elevator and begins escorting Grogu out of there. And it's quite clear, at least to me, that Grogu may be a very high valued youngling compared to the others in the temple. More of the 501st clones come closing in on speeders and around the corners of the building and Kelleran goes dual wield, wielding the blue and the green saber much like how Anakin did when he first fought Dooku in Attack for the Clones. And Kelleran precisely and efficiently takes out the clones and then gets on the speeder with Grogu and heads into the skies of Coruscant, flying away from the now burning Jedi Temple. As they fly through Coruscant, two LAT gunships chase after them. As Kelleran pilots the speeder and outmaneuvers one of the gunships, they swerve and speed past the plaza that is similar to that of some Ralph McQuarrie concept art, as well as a mountain monument, U-Mate, that we saw in the previous episode when Dr. Pershing was observing it. Getting past the gunships, at least for now, Kelleran mentions that he has some friends waiting for them up ahead. But the landing will be a bit bumpy, of course, as the gunships did shoot at and hit their speeder's engine. Anyways though, they land on a platform in the middle of the city that has a Naboo starship parked on it. One that very closely resembles the one that Padme Amidala used to pilot back in the prequels. After landing, Kelleran makes sure that Grogu is okay and is then met by a few Naboo fighters as they are there to help him in any way possible. But then they hear a gunship fly overhead and land on the platform with them. So one of the fighters tells Kelleran to take the ship and get out of there as a force of clone troopers including the Red Coruscant Guard assortment come storming out of the gunship and begin firing at the Jedi. As the Naboo fighters begin firing back, defending their Jedi friends with their lives. Something that I personally thought was really cool and kind of touching as it really shows how brainwashed the clones were due to the inhibitor chip and how the others around the galaxy still viewed the Jedi as their friends and allies even after all of the lies that were spewed out by Palpatine. Flying off in the Naboo starship and heading out of Coruscant itself, Kelleran and Grogu jump into hyperspace and in turn, Grogu jumps out of the flashback, leaving what happens next a mystery. So the armor is now finishing up the piece of armor that she has forged for Grogu, which is a rondel, with the signet of the Mudhorn on it, the same that Din got himself all the way back in season 1. Cutting to the gauntlet starfighter as it lands in the canyons and the seven Mandalorians walk along the cliff sides, and a few scenes that have a very seven samurai sort of feel to them. As from here on out, they must continue on foot so that they do not alert the raptor. They end up getting to the peak where its nest is located and they choose to spend the night here and climb it at dawn. At night, the Mandos prepare some food and Bo asks Mando how she is supposed to eat the food while keeping her helmet on with all of these people around her, as she is now adopted into this creed, at least for now. So he tells her that they must find a spot where no one else is so that they can safely remove their helmets and eat. But as Bo is the war leader here, she gets to stay at the fire by herself and eat, while everyone else finds their own spots. After she removes her helmet and eats, we cut to sunrise as they all prepare to climb the peak up the raptor's nest to retrieve the foundling and bring him back home safely, so they begin climbing. After some time, Bo, Paz, and Din make it up to the nest to see that it is empty and that the raptor is not there right now. So Din uses his helmet to detect a heat source coming from inside the nest. So Paz immediately heads in with no precautions as he reveals 
reveals that the fountain that was taken is actually his own son. This also means that if he is to perish, the Vizsla bloodline will live on. The heat sources end up being three of the raptor's babies and they start chomping at Paz, before the raptor arrives and he hides under some of the nest's wood. The raptor ends up spitting up the foundling and starts to try and feed it to its children, much like any bird in the real world would, before Paz launches at the beast, causing it to drop the kid and close its mouth on Paz, then taking him and the foundling and flying off yet again. So in a team effort, the remaining Mandalorians blast off behind the beast and eventually get Paz out of its mouth, leaving the kid to be freed next. In which Mando ends up doing himself after he activates his vibroblade and flies at the creature, freeing the child from its grasp and flying down to save him as a raptor falls down into the water below and then gets devoured by one of the alligator and turtle sort of creatures that we saw in the first episode of the season. Din then returns Ragnar to Paz and Paz thanks him for what he did and they both say this is the way, possibly putting aside their former beef and what other negative thoughts they would have still had about each other. They all return to the covert to even bring in the raptor's three babies that were left behind, possibly meaning that these creatures could become mounts for the Mandalorians to ride into battle in the future. The armorer takes notice to Bo's missing shoulder plate as when she was knocked back by the raptor, she lost one of them, so the armorer tells her to come with her for a repair as she deserves it after she has done the highest deed and honor in the creed, saving a foundling. As she forges up a new piece of armor for Bo, she asks her if she would like the signet to be the same as before, that of the night owl. However, Bo wishes to have the signet of the mythosaur instead now, and the armorer says that the mythosaur belongs to all Mandalorians no matter what clan they come from, so it's okay to have both on your armor. So she makes the signet and the shoulder plate and as she places it onto Bo, Bo asks her what she would say if she told her that she saw a mythosaur herself, where the armorer just goes on about how she would see it as good luck and how the creed provides many visions of different things. But Bo continues on how she actually saw a real living mythosaur in the living waters of Mandalore, as the armorer just responds by saying, this is the way. As Bo stares off at the mythosaur signet hung on the wall of the cave and forge, reminiscing on what she saw herself, on Mandalore, the episode ends off. Overall, a very good episode in my opinion, although I do think that it was definitely a bit short compared to prior episodes and seasons, but I really enjoyed the flashbacks to Order 66 and seeing the return of Ahmed Best was really nice. I can't wait to see where we go with his character alongside his story with Grogu. This episode made me really want to see even more prequel stuff, but all around the episode was a great entry for the series. But of course, I would like to hear your thoughts on this episode as well. So so make sure to leave them down below. Thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed our breakdown, don't forget to give it a like. And with that being said, we will see you all the next time that we go through and explore the nerdy multiverse.